Hello, my name is Fei Lang. I'm a radiologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, where I'm professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School. And uh, the purpose of this lecture is to discuss using ultrasound to evaluate the gallbladder. So we're going to be talking about ultrasound of the gallbladder, a common anatomic area to evaluate. So let's have a look at it. Uh, gallstones are usually not an issue when they're large and classic and show, as we see here, a clean acoustic shadow, a dependent position, and important, the fact that they're mobile. But sometimes when we're looking at a patient, we don't always get the classic appearance, or you might be fooled. For example, in this case, this looks like it could be a gallstone, but it's not. That's just some bowel gas. So seeing that a stone is mobile has important implications to be sure about the diagnosis. These are gallstones, but you can see how close one image mimics the other. Also, fluid in the right upper quadrant doesn't equal a gallbladder in all cases. In this patient, the history reveals there was a cholecystectomy, and uh, this is a post-op fluid collection. Um, what you really want to look for is make sure there's a wall and the configuration of the gallbladder. Every gallbladder has this fold in it called a junctional fold. It's an embryologic um, result of the development of the gallbladder, and um, you should look for it in cases where there's any question if you're dealing with the gallbladder. What I really want to focus on is not the obvious obvious stones, but the more subtle stones, patients who may have acute cholecystitis, if you're not sure you're seeing the gallbladder, the significance of intraluminal echoes that are not due to calculi, and the question of polyps, when do you worry, and are you dealing with adenomyomatosis or possibly cancer. Now we've already mentioned that when you have a gallstone you want to see shadowing, and in this case we see no shadowing here, or no significant shadowing, but shadowing here. And these are gallstones, but it's the same patient. So the question is, why did I not see shadowing over here? Here's a case with sludge balls, and I already mentioned these are gallstones. Two different patients, identical scans. So sludge balls, you wouldn't expect shadowing. Gallstones, you work to see that they do shadow. And what is the difference then between these two scans? Why do I see acoustic shadowing in the scan on the right? Well, it has to do with where the ultrasound, where the gallstone is relative to the ultrasound beam. And if I am not occluding the beam, or if I'm at the very edge of the beam, you will not see an acoustic shadow. So having the stone there at the edge and not occluding the beam is not a good way to go. What you really want to do is have a narrow beam with the gallstone at the level where the beam is narrow, and that implies you're using a high frequency, the highest frequency possible transducer that you can use will result in a narrow beam, and try to place that stone as you're going through it in the center of the beam to occlude it and create an acoustic shadow. Uh, here again, we do not see acoustic shadowing, and that's because this patient was just turned immediately before the scan was done. But having a patient hold a position for a few minutes lets the stones settle and aggregate and present as a larger geometric volume to the ultrasound beam and then create an acoustic shadow, as we see here, with some sludge in addition. Here's another example where in the classic LPO sagittal position, a shadow is not evident. Yet this same patient in the opposite right side down position, we see a relative mild but definite acoustic shadow over the liver. So why didn't we see the acoustic shadow in the LPO position? That's because as we come through the gallbladder, the patient is turned with the right side up. There will be bowel, as there often is, in the duodenum or the antrum, and that effectively precludes you from seeing a shadow because you're seeing lack of echoes over lack of echoes where there's the gas. If you have the patient in the opposite direction, however, as we see here, the, the small subtle stones as in present in this case will create an acoustic shadow that is visible over the echogenicity of the hepatic parenchyma. So with small stones, these are the problems. You don't 
e big stones are easy to see, but small stones are very difficult sometimes, and uh, looking for the acoustic shadow is very important. So again, to reiterate, use the highest frequency transducer you can. Have stones, small stones, aggregate. Think about scanning with the right side down if there's a question to see if you can get shadowing projected over the liver. Here, for example, is a case, this patient actually had two, quote, normal ultrasound exams, but had classic biliary colic when you questioned him. And, you know, I might see a little bit of sludge in the skull bladder on this clip, but no definite stones. It wasn't, it was the history that made me look harder at this patient. And when you're thinking about subtle stones, one of the things you might want to do is to turn the patient rather rapidly, as we see here. And you can see literally at least a hundred stones here, small individual stones that are very, very difficult to see. And that's why he had had two prior normal studies. These are the kind of stones that will cause problems as they pass into the biliary tree. So look for the rolling stones and it uh, depends on uh, what you mean by that, but I'm not talking about this type of <laughs> rolling stones. Look for the rolling stones in the gallbladder. When you have a... So to emphasize clues, important ones to see small stones, is to look for the acoustic shadow, scan appropriately to see it with the appropriate transducer, look for mobility, turn patients if necessary, and also if a patient is lying LPO or if there's a question of acute cholecystitis, look very carefully in the neck because that's a difficult area to examine due to the twists and the turns that are anatomically present at the level of the neck. Now let's turn our attention to making the specific diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. If you took 100 patients who have gallstones, uh, about a third or so will be asymptomatic throughout their lifetime. Uh, many patients will, however, go on to develop chronic symptoms, but nothing too acute, um, dyspepsia and so forth, when they eat perhaps a fatty meal. Um, the largest way patients go on to develop acute cholecystitis is going from those chronic symptoms to suddenly becoming acutely ill with severe right upper quadrant pain. Relatively few patients go from being asymptomatic to suddenly having acute cholecystitis. So what happens when people have acute cholecystitis? Typically a stone is moved from the region of the body of the gallbladder and look carefully because if it's impacted in the neck, it may be difficult to identify, and your eye may just pick these stones up, but make an effort to look around the curves and the twist in the neck to see if you can see a stone impacted in the neck. Often people have more than one stone, and the question in this case is, is this an impacted stone and that's a free stone, or is it two free stones? So it's important to show relative motion between this stone if it's impacted and that stone. And one of the things people often will do is turn the patient a little bit LPO or RPO. As in done in this case, you can see there's no real change in the position of the stone in the body to the neck in either image. So that is not sufficient in this case to prove whether or not there's impaction because neither stone has moved very well. You haven't turned the patient sufficiently. What I suggest you do is take the patient from the supine position, either turn them prone or sit them up into an erect position, and now clearly there's no question that that stone that's in the neck has not moved, but the one that was in the body has now moved to the fundus, clearly showing one is mobile and the other is fixed. Very important to make that determination. So what criteria do I use to make the specific diagnosis of acute cholecystitis? The two that I consider the most important or major criteria consist of the presence of stones in association with focal gallbladder tenderness. Other criteria that have been described and used include looking at the gallbladder size and shape, wall changes, pericholocystic fluid collections, and intraluminal changes. But I consider these minor findings because they are not as specific as the major criteria of stones with focal gallbladder tenderness or a positive Murphy sign. Now the problem here is that I can take a picture of all of these criteria except I cannot take a picture of focal gallbladder tenderness, a major criterion. So I have to know how to elicit a Murphy sign. And various things have been described in the literature, but what I like to do is to look at this in two ways. One, first I ask the patient to take one finger and 
show me with one finger where they hurt in their right upper quadrant. And if they rub over their entire right upper quadrant, that is definitely not a Murphy sign. If they take their finger, on the other hand, and point to a one spot, and then I take my transducer, and I see that spot corresponds to the gallbladder, that is very suspicious for a Murphy sign. Then in a more objective manner, I try to take I take the transducer and I tell the patient I'm going to push in three spots and they should denote to me which is the most tender. And let's say the second place I push is over the gallbladder and then they say that is the area that was most tender. That will, in my mind, confirm a Murphy sign. So I do two things. One is the patient shows me where they hurt and the second is I try to use the transducer to blot in various areas one of which corresponds to the gallbladder, and the patient says, yes, that is where the pain is. Wall changes are interesting. Uh, most patients who have acute cholecystitis will have wall changes, and some with chronic cholecystitis will have some thickening of their wall. Now, what I would like to do is not just look at wall changes specifically, but to determine if the wall is diffuse or focally thickened. Now, when it's diffusely thickened, yes, it could be due to acute or chronic cholecystitis, but there are a large number of other entities that can cause diffuse wall thickening, including a patient who's not fasting, a patient who has chronic low albumin, hepatitis, heart failure, and even HIV with association uh, due to AIDS, cholangitis. So if you look at this list, often, except for the top of that list, acute cholecystitis or chronic cholecystitis, often diffuse gallbladder wall thickening is not associated with primary gallbladder disease. Let's look at a few examples. Very, very thick in gallbladder with sludge in the lumen. The CT showing the same thing. Notice how complex fluid on ultrasound is so much uh, more dramatic than it is on the CT scan. This is the same patient. That is acute hepatitis with dramatic diffuse wall thickening. On the other hand, here's a patient with acute cholecystitis, very, very similar findings. This patient, as we can see with a shrunken liver, nodular contour, ascites, has a diffuse wall thickening, and that is due to hypoalbuminemia associated with the chronic liver disease. Now, sometimes people say ascites causes wall thickening, and as you can see in this case, a normal thickness to the gallbladder wall in association with ascites. It's really the hypoalbuminemia that commonly occurs with ascites that causes the wall thickening. It's not ascites per se. Now here is a case where some people might look at this and think the gallbladder wall is diffusely thickened. But if you look at it carefully, it's only the portion of the gallbladder that is in contact with the undersurface of the liver that looks thick. And as a matter of fact, this isn't wall thickening at all. This is a patient who has edema of the gallbladder fossa. And this is a person who has acute pancreatitis causing this. How does this happen? Well, if you think of either pancreatitis or possibly peptic disease occurring down in this area of the duodenum or head of the pancreas, inflammation can develop and spreads in a retrograde fashion along the hepatoduodenal ligament or the course of the bile duct and then rests by the area of the gallbladder neck and subsequently dissects into the gallbladder fossa, hence giving you this appearance. So just be aware that when you have this asymmetric type of thickening just in the undersurface of the liver that it probably is not gallbladder wall thickening but maybe due to pancreatitis. Here's just another example of two patients. Notice the patient with acute hepatitis has diffuse wall thickening all the way around. The acute pancreatitis is a nice example with the fatty liver showing the edematous change in the area of the gallbladder fossa and no thickening on the opposite wall. Focal gallbladder wall thickening has a long list of differential diagnoses, and these different entities often look different one from another. But if you consider polyps, metastases, adenomyomatosis, carcinoma, etc., the rest of the list, these are gallbladder conditions, even though they look different from one another. So focal gallbladder wall thickening almost always is due to primary gallbladder disease. When it's in the context, of course, of pain and so forth, uh, we might be thinking of severe gallbladder, uh, severe 
cholecystitis, such as a gangrenous gallbladder. So let's take this case. Is this a good scan? Well, there is diffuse wall thickening on both sides of the gallbladder. I'm sure you've already appreciated a stone in the neck, but there's a problem here because the images of the fundus are not good. And it's very, very important when you're looking at the gallbladder not to forget the fundus. Uh, the fundus really does deserve our respect. And we can see that when somebody has severe acute cholecystitis, the problem is that the fundus often suffers first. And that's because there's a poor blood supply to the fundus of the gallbladder. Um, we can see the um, hepatic artery taking off, then the cystic artery coming into the neck of the gallbladder, and then it peters out by the time we reach the fundus. So the fundus of the gallbladder suffers the ravages of acute cholecystitis initially, and we can see there's some irregular thickening here at the fundus. When somebody has a gangrenous or perforated gallbladder, severe cholecystitis, the wall changes then particularly involve the fundus with irregular thickening. You may see intraluminal changes. Sludge is not specific, but if you can see stranding, it will suggest that the mucosa of the gallbladder is sloughing in association with necrosis and gangrene of the gallbladder. Pericholocystic changes are also often at the fundus if the gallbladder has perforated and has contained abscess or contained air collection. Here's a nice example where at the fundus, compare it to the CT. See the irregular thickening at the fundus in both examples. Dr. Netter agrees in his diagram of a gangrenous gallbladder. Now sometimes it's not just the fundus per se, but changes around the fundus that are important. This was a woman who actually had a CT scan, um, and I'm going to just show you the CT scan. And the CT clearly showed edema of the fat around the fundus of the gallbladder, but no stones. So ultrasound was done and did show clearly stones because ultrasound is better at showing stones than CT. So the question was, did the patient have stones? And the answer was yes. But I'm showing you this case to show the pericholocystic inflammation or the dirty fat that is seen on the CT scan and the corresponding appearance on the ultrasound. Notice it appears white and echogenic. And that is what fat looks like when it's inflamed anywhere in the abdomen. We can see it around the appendix, around diverticulitis. And when you're worried about somebody who has um, inflammation of the gallbladder, look for these changes. Look for echogenic material that does not look like bowel, no wall, no compression, that signifies dirty fat. Here is another example of a patient who has a perforated fundus of the gallbladder. And on the clip, in addition, there's a contained fluid collection. Nice example, but can be difficult if you're not looking at the fundus carefully. Here's another example, uh, and I have two clips here. We can see it contained with fluid debris level, um, abscess at the fundus on the sagittal, and also on the transverse skin. There's sludge in the lumen, and now there's a contained fluid debris level at the fundus. Here's another example where we can see changes and the clip, I think, will help you. We can see sludge, and there's some stones in the gallbladder. But notice the dirty shadowing at the level of the fundus due to emphysematous cholecystitis. See the perforation on the corresponding CT at the level of the fundus and the contained abscess that is seen both on ultrasound over here and on CT over here. A calculus cholecystitis is a very difficult diagnosis to make clinically because there are often intercurrent illnesses. The ultrasound findings are nonspecific because by definition there are no stones. The patients often are too sick to localize whether or not they have pain over their gallbladder. And once gangrene and perforation occur, you lose that sonographic Murphy sign. So it's very challenging to make the diagnosis. And often when it's clinically a worrisome finding, we will do biliary aspiration and even place a cholecystostomy tube. But one of the things you can look for is 
evidence of inflammation around the gallbladder, pericholocystic inflammation. And here's an example, no stones, a very sick patient, and all that white echogenic material around the neck and in the porta hepatis here corresponds to what we see on the CT scan with that dirty fat. So that is what we have to hang our hat on. And here coming down the porta hepatis as well along the hepatoduodenal ligament. If you have an old scan to compare, you will see that this is now increased in comparison to that old scan, and also here in the region of Morrison's pouch. Again, to compare with the CT, we can see the fluid on CT, the fluid on ultrasound, the dirty fat on CT is the white echogenic material on ultrasound. And it's, I can't emphasize how important it is to look for inflamed fat on ultrasound. It doesn't jump out and grab you. You have to seek it out and um, look carefully for that pericholocystic inflammation. And here's just an example at the bedside where we're replacing a cholecystostomy tube in a gallbladder with a calculus cholecystitis. Now, what if you're having trouble seeing the gallbladder? It's not visible. Well, it may be very contracted. It may be filled with stones or sludge. Um, these are much less likely. So here's a case where we really don't see the gallbladder, but we see the telltale so-called WES or wall echo shadow sign. The wall is the first line. The stones uh, that are filling the gallbladder is the second concentric line. Notice they're rounded and we can clearly see those are stones. And then there's a little bit of bile between the wall and the stones and then the shadowing. Most often it's due to a gallbladder filled with stones, as we see in this case. Now sometimes, again, history is very important because this looks like a West sign, but this is not. It could be due to a patient whose gallbladder is totally contracted and maybe has some air in the stomach, but this is actually somebody who has no gallbladder and this is just air in the stomach mimicking a West sign. So history is very, very important. And if you're not sure, uh, you can give the patient some water to see if this indeed is in the stomach as it was in this case. Now it's very important when we're looking for the West sign to contra contrast it to a single line that we're seeing here with a porcelain gallbladder. Remember the West is two concentric white lines, a porcelain gallbladder, a single line, and this becomes very important because of the association of a porcelain gallbladder with gallbladder cancer. So if somebody has a porcelain gallbladder, it certainly should be removed. If somebody has a West finding, even though um, there may be many stones, if the patient's asymptomatic, often nothing is done. So is this one or two lines? Well here I think it clearly looks like a single line, so you might consider a porcelain gallbladder. But now look at the same patient and we can see that there are two lines, not a single line, w making this actually a Wes finding or a gallbladder filled with stones as opposed to a porcelain gallbladder. So what's the difference between here and here? The difference is two megahertz. Five megahertz transducer used here, only a three megahertz used over here. You must use the highest frequency transducer possible to get adequate resolution to show this, because in this case, this patient did not need a cholecystectomy, whereas if you thought it was a WES, uh, where if you thought it was a porcelain gallbladder, it should be surgically removed. So that's a very important distinction. Here's a patient with, with a 5 megahertz we still couldn't tell, and therefore a CT scan was appropriately done proving a porcelain gallbladder. Whenever you see a porcelain gallbladder, of course, look carefully because most of these are associated with stones and we already mentioned the possibility of cancer. And when we look carefully in this patient, you can see there is a mass adjacent to the gallbladder in the liver and uh, this is what the CT looked like and uh, this person was already being treated for their inoperable gallbladder cancer. Now, intraluminal echoes can be due to an awful lot of different conditions in addition to stones. It could have sludge, you might have artifacts, milk of calcium, they may look like membranes, blood or pus, or neoplasm. So let's briefly touch on these. Typical sludge is homogeneous low-level echoes that are due to stasis of bile, bile crystals, calcium bilirubinate, cholesterol crystals. We've already said they're homogeneous, they move slowly, and very importantly, sludge does not shadow. Is this sludge in this case then? 
Not really if you look carefully, because as soon as you put a higher frequency transducer on, we can see this is a contracted gallbladder. Notice the central luminal line of a completely contracted gallbladder with diffusely thickened wall. So technique is always important, and I emphasize over and over, use the highest frequency possible to make an appropriate diagnosis. Not a four, but in this case, harmonics with a five made a better diagnosis. Typical sludge has a fluid debris level, as we see here. If you see what does not look like a fluid debris level, but a rounded uh, grouping of echoes in the lumen, be wary that that may not be sludge. And in this case, that is a blood clot with hemobilia. Here's another example. Notice it's not a fluid debris level, it is rounded. And here is the hemobilia seen on the CT scan. Um, this could certainly be a sludge ball, but if you put color on and you show the stalk of a polyp, then it's not a sludge ball. Sludge balls often are multiple, as we see in this example. Now, sometimes you'll see what looks like sludge. Clearly, no argument about that. But then, when you scan the patient from a different position, it's gone. And this actually is an artifact. And what is it due to? This is due to a so-called side lobe artifact. What happens here is if you take the transducer, as we often do, scanning the patient in an LPO position, pointing it toward the duodenum, the sound will come in to the patient's gall through the patient's gallbladder, but there will be these were problematic side lobes, and they are not in the main beam. And if they hit something that's very reflective, like bowel gas in the duodenum, they will be returned to the transducer, and the transducer only knows it was hit by an echo that took a certain time path to return to the transducer. It will always put that echo in the main beam. And depending upon the time it took, that will be the position where it will be. And as you can see here, that side lobe will then be projected in the lumen of the gallbladder, as we see here, as that troublesome uh, looking sludge. So really what you want to do is not point toward bowel when you're looking, if you're questioning if it's real or artifactual. And if you point it away from the duodenum, as we see here, there will no longer be the side lobe artifact. Another reason that you can get uh, echoes that are pseudo sludge, if you will, if you are, if you're not occluding the beam, if you have partial voluming of duodenum in the beam, that too can be projected in the lumen of the gallbladder as pseudo sludge. So, important reasons: patients who have sludge in the gallbladder are typically those we said who have stasis due to not eating, or anybody with an obstruction. Uh, who can't empty their gallbladder because of an obstruction anywhere in the biliary tree from the gallbladder neck down to the distal duct. Now, if you see what looks like sludge, but it is shadowing, well, that is possibly an entity called milk of calcium, where a patient has prolonged stasis of crystals in their gallbladder and precipitates out this very um, high uh, level of calcium in the sludge, and that can cause shattering. But small stones can appear similar. However, see on CT, the fluid debris level here, similar to the ultrasound, in this case, due to milk of calcium. Now, what happens if you see membranes in the gallbladder lumen? Well, in this case, it's due to sloughing of the mucosa in a patient who has a gangrenous gallbladder because it has infarcted the wall. Another entity with membranes can be hemobilia, where the clot organizes, and as it matures, you, just like in an ovarian cyst, you can see membranes. Other reasons that you can have um, echoes in the gallbladder, as we see here, or another example, a lot of people would look at this and say this is a large polyp or it's a tumor, but notice, importantly, there's no vascular flow. Notice also the wall is intact. Gallbladder cancer is very aggressive and typically does not respect the wall of the gallbladder. So when we see this mass without echoes in it, we again should think of a blood clot. And this is another example of hemobilia. CT number greater than 30 confirms hemobilia on the CT scan. Another example of echoes in the lumen and stones but this looks more like a heterogeneous mass, and look always very carefully, is there a liver mass here? Because as I say, gallbladder cancer typically 
is very aggressive. And when we look carefully here, you can see it broke right through the wall. And uh, that is an important clue that we're dealing then with a gallbladder cancer here. And we can see the same thing on the CT scan. And Dr. Netter also shows that aggressiveness of this tumor uh, with gallbladder cancer. Now let's just turn our attention for the few last minutes to polypoid masses and then adenomyomatosis. We see patients here who have small polypoid masses in the gallbladder. Is a cholecystectomy indicated? Well, not when they look like this. And what do we mean by these benign multiple polyps? They are multiple and they're each less than five millimeters. They have a narrow neck. The wall is respected. Um, if you, on the other hand, have a single or maybe a cluster of small, um, non-mobile, non-shadowing um, masses, then we get more worried, especially if they're broad-based as we see here. This is metastatic melanoma, and this is a patient who actually at surgery had carcinoma in situ. Obviously an important time to diagnose as opposed to when it is um, spread outside the gallbladder. Notice the broad base attachments in both cases. They are relatively solitary or just paired as in this case. They will be in general greater than 10 millimeters. 5 to 10 millimeters, if they're multiple, we tend to want to watch those, uh, and typically they don't really grow with time as far as my experience. Here's a very interesting case. Clearly this is not hemobilia because we see the blood uh, flowing within this mass, but notice that the wall is intact, and that is a clue that probably it's benign, but the large size greater than 10 suggests it should come out. This was a benign polyp, and this case was lent to me thanks to Bill Middleton. So polyps can become quite large. What about this case? Be careful. Here, everybody, I think, would focus on the stone, but look beyond the stone. Most people with gallbladder cancer have stones. Don't just see stones and then forget about the rest of the gallbladder wall. In this case, blood flow is seen in this, and that becomes worrisome, not surprising, a case of gallbladder cancer. Another example, here are stones. And uh, is this study then just complete based on what we see? No. Notice we're using a sector scan here. Sometimes we need more than a single scan uh, transducer to evaluate the entire gallbladder, especially the near field. Where is the fundus? The gallbladder fundus deserves our respect. That sector scan didn't see it well. Change your transducer. Now we're using a curve six, and clearly the fundus is not looking healthy. So the curve transducer, the higher frequency, the broader near field, all came to our rescue. The next thing, obviously, is to put color on. Seeing flow there is very worrisome for a neoplasm. Looking further in the porta hepatis, we can see that abnormal lymph node there. Unfortunately, it was a small cancer, but it had already spread and uh, was therefore not a curable entity here. Now, three different patients all with the same condition, and the condition is adenomyomatosis. How do we make this diagnosis? Because if we can make the diagnosis, we do not want to do a cholecystectomy. The clues are often intramural cysts, typically at the fundus of the gallbladder, as we see there, and we can see some here. Again, focal changes at the fundus with multiple intramural cysts there. Also, looking for comet tail artifacts, as we see in the patients one and two, due to crystals that become deposited, crystals of bile that become deposited within these intraluminal cysts or Rokotansky Ashoff sinuses, known as RAS. And when we see that combination of focal thickening, particularly at the fundus with cysts and comet tails, we can confidently make the diagnosis of adenomyomatosis. And here's Dr. Netter's rendition. Yes, other areas can be involved, but the fundus is quite typical with these little cavities or cysts that trap cholesterol and bil uh, calcium bilirubinate crystals, get reverberation between these crystals causing those comet tails. So look carefully at the fundus. Here's an example where somebody asked me, was that an abnormality? And I, when a quick perusal, said it's probably just a reverberation artifact again, with a 4 megahertz sector transducer. But you can't stop there. When we looked further at this patient, changing again to the six-curve, higher-frequency transducer, 
clearly there was something wrong with this gallbladder. I suspected it was probably adenomyomatosis, but it was rather difficult for me to really get an ideal picture. That patient did go to surgery, was proven to have adenomyomatosis. So can we do any better even than I've done here? Because if possible, I'd like to not ch send the patient to surgery. Here's an example again, six megahertz curved transducer. I can't really say for sure if that's adenomyomatosis. Can I do better? Well, the answer is yes. Now I can see the Rokotansky sinuses in a contained mass in the fundus. How did I do this transducer? Believe it or not, I used a vaginal probe. This is the endovaginal probe. This is eight megahertz, a higher frequency. I know it sounds funny putting it over the right upper quadrant, but use whatever it takes to get a better picture, if possible, to avoid doing an unnecessary cholecystectomy. And this is, I believe, my last case where we can see CT was done first. The question was, is this a porcelain gallbladder? If it is, then the gallbladder should be removed because of the worrisome uh, development of cancer. The ultrasound here, we can see the cysts in the focal area of change in the fundus. We can see the comet tails, and those can often be even more dramatically revealed with this so-called twinkle artifact that we get from the irregularity of the crystals that we see in the Rokotansky uh, Ashoff sinuses, the so-called twinkle artifact, and confidently make the diagnosis of adenomyomatosis and avoid surgery. And this truly is my last case. Uh, again, is cholecystectomy indicated? Notice here, comet tails, but not coming from a thickened gallbladder wall. Well, I suppose this could be air in the lumen of the gallbladder, but the patient was not symptomatic and uh, therefore air, and did not have any reason to have air in the gallbladder based on a prior uh, interventional procedure, uh, ERCP, for example. So in this case, these are comet tails coming from the surface of a non-thickened gallbladder wall, so-called strawberry gallbladder, and it would be, these are just crystals of cholesterol deposition on the surface of the gallbladder, analogous to these little deposits on the strawberry of uh, the seeds that we see on the strawberry wall, uh, on, the gall on the strawberry wall, and that's why this has been called a strawberry gallbladder. And this too does not need to be removed. This is cholesterolosis as opposed to the adenomyomatosis that we've already talked about. So I hope you've ended up becoming a little bit wiser the wise old Al, as you've looked hard at the gallbladder here, and I hope this discussion has been helpful to you when evaluating the gallbladder with ultrasound. Thank you for your attention.